Joe Wilson. Not okay. <laughs> That's me. Test, test. You're free to run over. All right. Am I am I audible? Louder. We need some more. Do I have to lean way in? Yeah. All right. Okay. Uh, testing, testing, testing. Is that working? Up higher. If we could. That's as high as it goes. All right. It, it's at 11. Uh, I'll 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 talk louder. That's right. We will quadruple it. Uh, all right. Are we all set? Ready to go? All right. Uh, and welcome to our talk. Uh, my name is Josh Stone, and this is Patrick Fussell. Uh, we are penetration testers for a company called PSC. We mostly do PCI uh, assessments, though occasionally we do dip into other contexts. And uh, today we're talking about penetration testing. Uh, penetration testing has a lot of different contexts and shades of meaning these days. Uh, usually if you uh, look at most industry methodologies or if you take a class, you'll find that penetration testing looks something like this. We have some sort of identification of the resources that are available to us. We try to see if there are vulnerabilities there. We're going to exploit those and see where it leads us. Unfortunately, and something I feel like we have to mention here, is that there are lots of situations in our industry now where a penetration test looks a little bit more like this. And uh, just, uh, there, it's a good service. It's good to find vulnerabilities and verify that they're true, but it's not really a penetration test. Uh, what we're talking about in penetration testing, and especially in a compliance-focused pen test like a PCI scenario, 
Uh, we're talking about a situation where there is some identifiable objective. There's a success criteria that allows us to answer an important question with the pen test. So uh, in our case, when we're doing PCI pen tests, uh, the question is, is the cardholder data safe if somebody intrudes and breaches the internal network? Uh, so if we don't get hold of the cardholder data or access the environment that processes it, then even if we hacked some stuff, it doesn't necessarily mean that there's a problem as far as the PCI data. And it turns out in most real networks, there's something to hack somewhere. And the big question that's actually valuable is, can someone do something damaging? Uh, the things that we're most concerned about, are they at risk uh, in an intrusion? So uh, in that, along that vein, what we're talking about today is, is more of a, uh, a, a examples from the trenches, uh, as it were, uh, several scenarios from real pen tests or aggregated examples from uh, multiple real pen tests uh, to highlight some strategies that we use in that process. You know, it's not just about going through your five phases of pen testing and write a report. The point is you keep going within the time that you have available uh, to find that uh, success criteria, get those crown jewels. Uh, so what we're not talking about today, uh, we're not talking about zero days, we don't have some you know, spectacular vulnerability, we're not even really talking about the tools, what we're talking about is the strategy or the technique and the, the mental approach that we're using to work our way through a big network. This should be relevant to you if you're a pen tester or also if you're a defender. Uh, because uh, from the defense point of view, what I find is a lot of the things that really pan out for us, especially if you're doing your patching and vulnerability scanning and other you know, sort of uh, hygienic processes in your network, uh, there's still all this other stuff that's useful to a pen tester that kind of never really gets fixed. Uh, and you're disclosing lots of information that we can use that turns out quite handy. Uh, so I'll hop into the uh, first scenario, that one uh, Patrick will do. So I'll hand it over. All right, hopefully this isn't too far away, that sounds okay. All right, um, so there are what I think of uh, dozens of ways that you might frame a pen test, or, or if you were to go Google um, you know, pen test methodologies, you get, you get quite a few results. Um, I think one of the things that, and, and Josh sort of pointed this a little bit, is that these make the pen testing process seem very linear. You execute something, you finish with it, and you move on. I, I think that the, uh, the, the problem with this is that uh, in, in reality, that the things that you do in a pen test tend to repeat themselves or they're very organic to the situation. So, uh, for example, one of the first things you might see in any methodology in, involves uh, scanning and enumeration, right? So um, you're, you're using NMAP or MassScan or, or resolving DNS names or something. Uh, this might be something that you do once, but more than likely it's something you're going to do during maybe the exploitation, even post-exploitation, as you continue to build a picture of the network. Um, so, and just for example, Maybe as you begin the pen test, you, you do run some sort of initial scanning, get a feel for what can I see or where am I, and it might be something that's kind of ambiguous. You're in a user network and there's a server network somewhere, but you don't really know. Uh, as the the pen test progresses, oops, sorry, as the as the pen test progresses, um, that might break down. You so you start to see where uh, uh, certain users are assigned to certain segments or something something along those lines. Get a much better feel for uh, for what goes where. Um, so, one of the, the, uh, the things you really want to do is sort of pull some of that information together to, uh, to, to, get, a, to get a better feel for, uh, pull some of that information to get a better feel for, for how you might use it during the pen test. Uh, so, remote desktop is one of the services I think that's fairly ubiquitous in a, a Windows network. And, uh, am I getting feedback? It's uh, fairly ubiquitous in, in Windows Network, but one of the things you might you might notice or you might not realize in, initially about Remote Desktop is it actually can have some information that's fairly useful to you. Um, so if your user's already connected to the session and you connect to it as well, you'll see that uh, when you log into it, you might see their, their Active Directory domain name, you might see their username. Uh, and, and So keep that in mind for just a second. Uh, another uh, another piece of information that we might see as we start a pen test is uh, domain names, right? Um, DNS can give us a really good feel for for what's on the network. The the naming convention might be very uh, very excuse me might be very descriptive. <coughs> uh, so you might see things like DC one or DC two, maybe 
you know, SQL database or one. So it gives you a feel for what are these systems and what do they do. But another thing we might see is that uh, users might be associated with specific systems, right? Um, and when we resolve these names, we can tell, okay, these, these hosts are sitting in specific places and they belong to these users. Uh, but as we go back and take a look at the remote desktop session, you know, remote desktop might, be, might not be a great place to log into a hundred different sessions and try to collect usernames. But if we put it together with the DNS names, now we have a feel for uh, what is the actual user naming convention. And we can do a little uh, cut and grep and now we have a user list that we can use to uh, do something like build a password-based attack against Active Directory. It's, it's worth noting too, if you, you think about it, uh, there's no, no no using of null sessions on the domain controller. We don't have to find that there's no uh, authentication for the intranet or something like that so we can find usernames. Uh, these kinds of information disclosures are quite fun. Uh, and for this scenario, we move into the, the second example, uh, which is you know, we've now gotten that list of usernames and we check just to see if anybody has a bad password. And you might think, well, if it's a small network, I mean, who's going to have password one with a capital P? Uh, but actually, as your user population tends to infinity, uh, you definitely have somebody somewhere with a password of password one. Uh, and so here in this example, we, we've gotten the password for Joe Schmo. And uh, as we might expect, looking at the name, we're thinking, ah, it's really unlikely that Joe Schmo is a, an interesting user. But at least it's something. Uh, so we can check against the domain and find out what kind of user is he. Well, Joe Schmo is only in the domain users group. And this is one of those cases where a lot of times, if I was talking to the, the client, they would say, well, all you have is a regular user. That's not very powerful. They can't do anything in our network. No administrative rights, nothing. But as a pen tester, where are we in the pen test? And the question we have to ask ourselves most importantly is, what does domain users actually get us? What value is there in this user? And I want to borrow a concept that I ran into in a, a presentation by Halvar Flake a couple years ago. He talked about the compromise boundary. And, and the compromise boundary for a hacker is the set of all the things that you control or the things you could control given what you have. And what we've done in the pen test is we found an initial entry point and we've gone now from nothing to something. And something isn't everything, uh, but it's still a lot closer than where we were. Right, so uh, even though we really wish Joe Schmo was a schema admin, because uh, that would be awesome, uh, the fact that he doesn't control systems uh, is sad, but he actually has access to a lot of things in the domain. And the, the thing we're going to focus on right now is files. Uh, when you look at a typical network, there are lots of files, but some files are much more interesting than other ones. Uh, here are a couple examples of some files that have credentials embedded in them. Uh, and then there would be other examples of interesting files. I've had two occasions in the last couple years where I actually found VMware disk images that were on an open share, not an open share, but a share that an, an authenticated user could access. Uh, and from there I can extract password hashes. Uh, there are all kinds of wonderful things that you find in the, fi in the file environment in your typical corporate network. Uh, and so I'm going to be particularly interested uh, in finding out what Joe Schmo has access to. So uh, in a typical small environment, and maybe we've got a few tens of users or something like that, there are only about thousands of files to think about. And this is something I can go through probably in an afternoon. It might take me a couple hours to, to go through all their shares and see what Joe Schmo has access to, and that's no big deal. But as we scale this to a true enterprise where we've got tens of thousands or more users, uh, this becomes a very intractable problem for the pen tester. Uh, we're not talking about thousands of files, we're probably talking about thousands of shares. And each of those could have thousands of files. And I just don't have the time to go through millions of files to find that one that's cool. Uh, so how am I going to do this? I can't use manual techniques. I can't uh, grab a Windows box and map a share. Uh, clicking through there will absolutely kill me. Uh, and then there are some other options, other SMB clients, and those work fine. Uh, the SMB client tool that comes with Samba has a recursive feature, so I, I could, in principle, spider the shares with that or something, get back a good body of information. 
It, it's inconvenient though because the recursion behavior and uh, the way SMB client does that is inconvenient for me. It'll get bogged down in these ginormous shares uh, that you know, it'll get stuck on a backup share or something that has you know, a, a billion DAT files and it'll just never come back. Uh, so I'm not the only guy who's ever done this, but I put together a tool uh, some years ago called Plunder because I was just so frustrated with only being able to look at a few shares and knowing there's all this stuff out there that I haven't already gotten. Uh, so I'll walk you through what, what this looks like. Uh, but focus not so much on the tool, but focus on the idea. Uh, first, we scan the network. Uh, we find ourselves a bunch of SMB servers. Uh, formulate that as an input to, to Plunder. It just takes SMB URLs as input and it'll uh, perform whatever action we instruct it to given that input. And then we run Plunder against a whole lot of systems. And this is an example running against about 700 different shares uh, with five threads. If I run it with 30 threads, I, I've successfully indexed networks as large as like 18 million files. I get, I get the Joe Schmo user and in a couple hours I can get a list of all 18 million files that he can get to. Uh, and that body of information is tremendously useful because what was a manual process is now a tractable uh, post-analysis uh, situation. Uh, so a, a typical result would be something like this. I get uh, a whole bunch of files back, uh, just lists of all the files he can access, and I've got over 300 web.config files. Everybody know what's in a web.config file? Uh, what are the odds that at least one of these 300 files has a database credential that's probably going to be SA or maybe it has a service account uh, for Active Directory or something like that. Uh, but what's, what's fun is uh, now I've scaled up and gotten the information about the files I have access to but it, I still have a difficult problem and that is it could take me all day to download 300 web.config files and look through them. Uh, so Plunder also has a, a download and mirroring capability so that I can take that list of SMB URLs that I got from the spider scan and run it right back through and have it download. It'll create a local directory tree that mirrors the network file system and pull all those files down for me and I can just use a recursive grep uh, and find me the credentials. Uh, so uh, before you think, well that's kind of, you know, my network wouldn't ever have that problem. Uh, the fact is every network I've ever been to except for two, I found something that I shouldn't have had access to on a fi file share. It might be this situation where I've got a, uh, an unprivileged user and I can escalate my privileges, or it might even be a case where I've got an administrative user and I can get information that leads me outside the domain. So I can get access to the network devices, or I can get access to the Unix environment, or the mainframe, or something like that. And this turns out to be a tremendously valuable strategy for pulling this information out of a network when I've only got a week. So with that, we'll hop into uh, scenario number three. All right. So uh, I think in, in probably most goal-based pen tests, or in particular in a, a PCI pen test, um, we have this concept of, of this sort of a low security network and a high security network. Um, and, and typically we expect that, that we're going to execute the pen test from the perspective of the lower security network and trying to gain access to that, that high, higher security segment. Um, it can take lots of different forms. I think this can, this scales out to, to different ways of, of doing this. Uh, however, I think our, our most commonly we see that this is a, a network segmentation boundary. Um, somewhere along the line, we're preventing traffic from traversing the two segments. And now, uh, this, sometimes you might see that there's maybe a handful of services, maybe there's an application exposed, but uh, I think more commonly we, we tend to think of this as a, a strict segmentation boundary where there should be, there should be no services tra uh, traveling directly between the two. Uh, however, we know that somebody in this lower security network is probably accessing the high security network. Maybe it's, um, it's somebody who, who's, again, who's accessing the application or it's people who are administering the network. At some point, somebody's moving between the two. They're probably not walking their laptop over to a different network every time they need to do something. Um, one thing to keep in mind, especially as a, a network tends to grow in size, when we have these strict segmentation boundaries, something that's going to sort of naturally evolve from that is the, the uh, increase in, in the complexity of administering the network. Um, because we have to interact with it in different ways, we have to think about how are we going to, to make changes to those systems and make sure that they're, they're up to date or, or whatever the particular challenge is. So what happens is you may start with something that looks like this and you have, a, 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 in theory, a, a secure network but uh, what it ends up looking like is something more like this. 
So we, we poke holes that, that start off as something temporary, they end up being permanent, and then you forget about them and they, uh, they, they stay around forever. So, uh, so in this scenario, what we're thinking about is uh, we've already done our scanning and enumeration. Um, we gained some initial access to the network already. Uh, we maybe found an unprivileged user, and we found some some DA creds, like uh, Josh was sort of alluding to. We, we we so now we have a domain administrator access to our network. The question becomes, what's the what's the next step? How do we move from how do we move from this low security place to the high security place? So we want to, uh, you know, for a PCI pen test, we have a talking thing about the, the cardholder data environment is our highest security network. So what do we want to do? We want to find a way into that, that called cardholder data environment. One really great tool for accomplishing this is, uh, is your NetStat. Um, you know, it, on, on just about any system, NetStat is essentially just looking for what are the connections to and from any particular host, right? Um, now I'll go ahead and point out one really great way to, to, to gain this information or gather this across a, a, uh, a range of hosts is Josh's uh, route hunter tool. Um, essentially all this does is grabs net stats from a, a select list of systems for you. Um, you give it the target IPs and some credentials and it dumps the, the, the data for you. So now you have net stats from you know, everybody on network or everybody on your, your, your local uh, or, or success, directly accessible to you with your credentials. So what can we do with this information? Well, probably one of the most obvious things is we can just grep for a network range. Maybe we know that um, a, a, a target range is, is what we're really looking for. A quick grep will say, oh, look, there's, uh, there's, there's some direct connections that we can reuse. Um, maybe it's something we can abuse by a mature pivot, or maybe it's something that uh, requires a more um, advanced exploitation, but, but we have an idea of where to start at least. But what if we don't see any direct connections? This data can still be incredibly useful to, um, to you, and uh, what I want to touch on real quickly is a way to go over it. Another uh, handy little script that uh, Josh wrote involves using, uh, taking these, these net stats and using Graphiz, which is a, essentially just a visualization tool uh, to, to, to actually visualize all the network connections. So what the, what the Josh's script does is it will turn the net stats into a dot file. So this is basically just a textual description and we, we execute a command and it draws a nice picture for us. Um, so one of the, the first things I think that you can, you can use or look at when you, uh, when you generate one of these is, let's look for anywhere where we see maybe a ton of connections coming into a particular host. Um, this might be something as simple as a, a file server or a, a database, um, but maybe it's something like a jump box that, that we didn't know about before. Uh, in particular, I think this is useful when you look at these uh, these connections and you see something that you didn't know about before. Maybe it's something that the uh, the IT team or the network team uh, didn't tell you about, doesn't know about, or doesn't want you to know about. Um, maybe it's a, a subnet that you didn't see before. But if we see a bunch of ho uh, a bunch of connections coming into a single host and it's a, a subnet we've never seen before, it particularly it may be very interesting. Um, the great thing about Route Hunter is that it uh, it can quickly gather this information. Uh, I've had an engagement this year where we're able to cover about 3,100 hosts in under nine minutes. Uh, so you can run this a couple of times throughout the course of an engagement and get a really great picture of, of the network and get a feel for, you know, who should be going to where and what, what, what should that look like. And when we can spot these outliers that might tell us, hey, look, there's the, uh, the jump box that the customer forgot to tell you about that they forgot to configure MFA for. Um, and now you've got your, your point of exploit. And, and as Patrick was saying, you know, with, with Route Hunter, once you've parked yourself with domain admin on a network, just run, run something like that every 30 minutes or every hour for a day, and you'll see the behavior of the network over time. And I'm convinced that uh, what we're talking about, we just, uh, we're doing the first layer of analysis on that stuff. Uh, this, the material you can pull out of analyzing a big data set like that, if you can get it, is wonderful. Uh, going into the next scenario, uh, this is a little bit different. This is not a PCI uh, example, but in this case, it's a penetration test against a product company uh, that's concerned about people leaking information about their new products. Uh, so instead of looking for a PCI cardholder data environment, 
I'm, I'm looking for instead information about those new, new unreleased products. And this is different because you know, segmentation really uh, uh, should be very different in this case. Most places aren't going to have a, a PCI style CDE for protecting their product data. Uh, but uh, it turned out this one was actually quite challenging uh, for me and uh, my initial strategy going in didn't pan out. Uh, so I don't know about you, but I tend to overly romanticize uh, what I do for a living. It makes it a lot more fun. Uh, I typically think of your typical company as being kind of like a medieval kingdom. You've got a nested hierarchy of enclaves and uh, you know, different silos that have complex political relationships. Uh, you've got, if you look at an org chart, it's basically uh, a system of feudal vassals and lords. Uh, which makes it a lot more fun uh, to, to just think about it that way. I figured in this case, once I got the keys to the kingdom, uh, domain admin, I should be able, I'd have the run of the kingdom, so I can just go to all the places and find the little hamlets and burgs where they're making this information about unreleased products. Uh, and it turned out it, it defied my ability to find them. Uh, I had gone through the shares, I had gone through Active Directory, and I'm getting to the end of the pen test, it's the 11th hour, uh, and I don't have anything. I have stuff about current products, but nothing that meets the success criteria. I haven't gotten to the goal. So I start kind of flailing around. I'm trying uh, all my Statue of Liberty plays, uh, and Hail Marys, and so forth, uh, and, and just <clears throat> thinking, great, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to end up with domain admin in a non-segmented network, and I'm not going to have the success, the success criteria met. Uh, so. I'm going back through my notes and thinking, well, what do I have? Because at any point in a pen test, yeah, to me, if you're to boil the entire process of pen testing down to one thing, it's that I, I think, what do I have? Where do I want to be? Does anything I have get me there or closer to there? And so I'm just going through the, the things I had done so far. And one of the quirky little scans I had done for, for some reason was to collect a listing of all the services running on all the systems in the domain. I think at the time I was probably looking for antivirus suites or checking consistency of implementation for you know, some defensive uh, tool that they had in the environment. Uh, but I, I started thinking through and I thought, you know, if I was on a team that makes uh, information about new products, maybe I'm a, a product designer, I'm an engineer or something like that, I bet I have some special software that everybody doesn't get. And I know, for example, with Visual Studio, a lot of times you'll see a couple services associated with Visual Studio. I often use that to find developers so that I can target them. And I thought, well, I wonder in this case, uh, maybe the same thing might work. So I had this body of, of knowledge, and I started exploring it a little bit. But what's kind of fun about uh, services, uh, there are some services like the browser service that are actually running on all computers. Uh, every Windows box has the browser service running. So that's not a very useful service for me. It's not going to help me identify a special group that's different from the others. But then if you go to the other extreme, I've got something like 700 services that are running on only a single machine. And that's overly discriminating. That just tells me who has a weird network card or who has the one decent NVIDIA card or something. Uh, and so that's not going to help me so much. What I'm particularly curious about is anything in this zone where I see it's between 5 and 20 machines that have this service, that's about the size to me of a team or maybe a small department or something like that. So I start looking through the data and uh, as I'm going down I, I see that there are 12 systems that have the SolidWorks licensing service installed. And how many people here recognize SolidWorks and know what SolidWorks is? Uh, Okay, cool. We got one. Yeah, maybe this wouldn't show up uh, you know, to everybody immediately, but I was an administrator in a mechanical engineering department once, and I know exactly what SolidWorks is. Uh, SolidWorks is a CAD package. Uh, it's a, a nice one. It's an expensive one. I wish I had one because I also have a 3D printer, and that, that would be nice. But uh, uh, anyway, I started thinking, well, I bet. I bet SolidWorks is for people who are making the mechanical you know, drawings and so forth for these new products. And so these are the CAD designers' workstations. Uh, and then as I started to explore their boxes, uh, I realized why I could never find this information on the file shares. It's because these CAD designers don't use the file shares. They, they store everything on their local disk. I usually exclude C drives when I'm spidering shares because they're generally uninteresting. But by following this path, uh, I was able to find the information about unreleased products, and there I have my success criteria. Uh, and this was a very fun and uh, interesting pen test to me. It was the first time I'd, I'd had this kind of intuitive leap in, in this 
uh, you know, manner uh, at this point. But what I realized is that this, this is actually something that, uh, as a strategic move, is something I, I now use all the time. But what I'm interested in is any system that's not like other systems is more interesting to me. There's some set of baseline boxes that are all about the same, uh, and those are, those are useless. And in a big network, there might be thousands or tens of thousands of uninteresting machines. Uh, and if I can find distinctive characteristics that help me figure out which ones are different, and I can collect that information efficiently, uh, then I'm able to uh, you know, narrow my focus in my limited time for the pen test and, and get to where I can answer the useful question. So once you see this one time, you start to see it everywhere. And you know, there are situations that come up, like, you know, uh, I'm interested in finding people that might have dual-homed machines. You, know, you can get this information a few different ways, but if you can list the interfaces on all systems and pull that information together, uh, you spot interesting things. You also find anyone that has VMware installed because they have a few extra network interfaces. You see anybody that has weird VPN clients configured because each of those will have their own little virtual interface. It's, it's actually this really interesting body of data. Uh, or what if I can get a task listing, uh, list the processes on all the systems in the domain and pull that together in, in one body of knowledge? Uh, that, that ends up being tremendously useful because I can see all the people who have the, the terminal client for the mainframe uh, or something like that running. You know, these things help me to narrow down my focus and, f and uh, concentrate on those groups of systems that are special and unique. Uh, and then uh, an another quick example, uh, I, I had a, a situation not too long ago where I had about 6,000 uh, users in the environment uh, sitting on the network and some of them can VPN into the CDE. Uh, well, I'm interested to know like which ones can and there is no Active Directory group that just tells me these are the CDE VPNers. And so I'm looking at the endpoint for the VPN, and I realize, oh, it's a, it's a Cisco VPN. Uh, you know, it, maybe if I just collect a listing from program files from all of the systems in the domain, I can tell who has a Cisco AnyConnect client installed. I took 6,000 users and windowed that down to 180-ish users or something like that, and that's tractable. I can't park and, uh, key loggers and man-in-the-middle agents and, and other fun you know, malware things on 6,000 boxes responsibly. But I can go after 180, that's quite doable. So starting to think about what information can I collect and post-process to focus my, you know, my death ray, whatever, whatever we're doing in, in the pen test, uh, turns out to be a, a wonderful and very profitable strategy. So for scenario five, we're not handing off. I get two in a row. Uh, scenario five is uh, also a little bit different. Yeah, we've already got domain admin, and we're trying to get our access to the cardholder data environment. Uh, but in this case, I actually know exactly where it is. I know where the crown jewels are. They're sitting in that, that locked box over there. And the problem is when I try to access it, I come up against a challenging barrier. Uh, so here, you know, when I was a younger pen tester, uh, I always would just throw my hands up and say, okay, you win, you know, you've got a good network, oh, you hate that MFA. Uh, and uh, over time, it just kind of, it sticks. You think, yeah, man, there ought to be something I can do. Uh, and so you know, last year at DerbyCon, I had the opportunity to present a few strategies we used to get around multi-factor. And uh, even a heavily protected environment, you know, we should expect there should always be at least something we can do. So today, I'm not going to talk about the bypasses I did last year. Uh, this one's a different one. And in fact, this one is one that, that to me, it kind of fits into the so silly, I can't believe it works. But in fact, it's so easy to do and it works so often, I go to this one first now. In fact, this, this month, I've had two pen tests in a row where I use this exact technique to uh, get access to the cardholder data environment. So uh, to understand where this comes from, there's a particular vulnerability that I'm leveraging here. And uh, it, it all comes down to Bob. Uh, so this is Bob. He's the regular average Mark I uh, uh, corporate user, okay? Uh, he lives in the cube farm with all of the other uh, denizens and works out his day, you know, whatever his role is. And the big problem with Bob's day is that he is absolutely ruled by a harsh and unforgiving task mistress. And that is his calendar. Uh, typically, most environments would not consider the calendar to be a vulnerability, but this gets kind of uh, kind of fun once you do it. Uh, you see, in Bob's day, he's got a bunch of meetings that clog it up. 
as far as he's concerned, most of those just use up an inordinate amount of time and uh, keep him from getting work done. It's not all bad because sometimes he gets to go out to eat uh, and then there are those opportunities to get up and walk around the office a bit, head to the water cooler, make a coffee run, uh, you know, commiserate with the other inmates. And, uh, and then, of course, nature calls on occasion for a little uh, solitude and contemplation. And really, when you get down to it, the fact is, for much of the day, Bob's computer looks kind of like this. And that isn't so interesting. I see computers like this all the time. But... Sometimes this is very special because behind this screen, Bob has a remote desktop session that's already multi-factor authenticated in the cardholder data environment. And because it's so annoying to multi-factor every time that screen locks, it doesn't multi-factor when he unlocks that one. So if I could only know when this situation occurs, maybe I could take advantage of that session. So I start thinking to myself, if I could uh, wait until Bob goes to the CDE and then tell when he locks his screen, I already know his password, so I could remote desktop into his box and then just use it. It's kind of the dumbest hack ever, but you know, if I could get the right situation, then I'd come off looking like a rock star. And someone would look at it and say, well, how on earth did you ever find that situation? And it turns out that uh, this is really cool in theory, uh, but in practice it can be kind of difficult. In a small network, there are only so many people who access the target zone. And then the other problem is some people are kind of fastidious, and they close their windows before they lock and go to lunch and whatever. So in, in a typical small environment, this is kind of hard to pull off. You have to wait potentially for a long time for the right situation to occur. And, you know, I can't, I can't bill the customer for pen testing where I'm just waiting for something to happen. Got to do something. Thanks, Joe. Uh, but there's this interesting thing that happens with scale. Uh, in the animal kingdom, it's good to be in a herd, right? If you're the, if you're a, a wildebeest, you don't want to be alone. You want to be in a whole big group of wildebeests because you're, you're relatively safer from the predator. The network is the opposite, though. The bigger the network gets, the more at risk it is because only one of those wildebeests has to get caught and the attacker gets what he wants, right? I'm not, I'm not the herd, I'm, I'm the predator in this situation. When the network gets big, there aren't just a handful of users that can get to this place. You don't really get big by having only two people who work in your cardholder data environment, right? So there are probably many, many targets, could even be thousands depending on the situation. Maybe you've got call centers and everybody connects to jump box and whatever. Uh, and so there's this interesting thing that happens with scale. Uh, what we're doing is we're calculating the set intersection of a bunch of groups of people. We start with the entire environment. Some of them can get to the CDE. Some of them are right now in the CDE. And then some of those might lock their screen. In the small environment, the number of people in that black shaded zone is probably small. It's probably about zero on average. But in a big network, it becomes non-zero on average, which means at any given time, there's probably one of these sitting out there somewhere. And now, the, the only challenge here, especially given what we've talked about so far, is finding people with screens locked. Uh, if you look on Google, you'll find that Stack Overflow suggests you write an executable that calls this Win32 API function, and you get back a struct, and it gets populated with some flag that tells you if the screen is locked. And I don't necessarily want to throw an executable out to all 6,000 boxes. Uh, I have to put that list in the report, right? So I've got a few things that make me say that's, that's hard. Uh, that's, that's not the easy way to do it. And actually, there are probably 100 different ways to get this information, but I just wanted to find an easier one. And the easier one that I stumbled on uh, is when Windows uh, locks the screen, it runs a program called logonui.exe. Since we already talked about, with Route Hunter, I can get net stats, but I can also just run a command and get the result back. I can get a task list from all the systems in the domain in about 10 minutes, and I can have this list. So now we have everything that we need. Uh, Patrick talked about net stat whispering uh, in order to get you know, the people who talk to the CDE. Uh, we can find the lock screens by checking for log on UI.exe. We can use the super elite uh, hacking tool called grep to figure out which ones are in those lists, and then any remote desktop client works. So you see this is basically exploit-free hacking. There's nothing going, I'm using admin rights to do a thing an admin can do, and then remote desktoping somewhere. So at any given time uh, in, during the assessment, uh, I can run two scans and a grep, and I get a list of all of the points where I can get to the CDE right now. 
Now, there, there are some caveats. Uh, there are uh, things that can go wrong, things you have to account for. might depend on what they're using to access the CDE and whatever. We can chat about some of the details if you want to afterwards grab me. The biggest one, though, uh, was a substantial concern for me initially uh, because I thought, well, you know, what if Baby Bear gets back from the bathroom and figures out that somebody's been sleeping in his bed? The, the mouse is moving. Well, he wouldn't see that because he'll see the lock screen, but, you know, he, <clears throat> He sees that his windows are rearranged, and I was in the middle of typing some awesome command, some big PowerShell one-liner, uh, and, and and he caught me. I thought, well, that's that's got to be a serious risk, right? But it turns out uh, that in reality, it's not that big of a deal, because the first thing I saw when I remote desktoped into Bob's machine uh, was his calendar, and I can see that he's going to be trapped in that change control meeting for an hour which means I actually have a pretty good amount of time. If it happens that I don't see any reason why he's going to be gone for a little bit, well, then I'll just disconnect and wait for a better time. There's, there were two others in that scan you saw a couple slides ago, and I can just wait a few minutes and see if someone else pops up. Uh, and a few minutes on this box in the CDE is probably enough for me to identify you know, what exfiltration mechanisms I have available, find a C2 channel, install some malicious agent, and secure continuous control of that box, and that gives me uh, access to the CDE without having to ever worry about multi-factor again. So with that, scenario six. All right. All right, so in this, uh, in this last scenario, uh, it's something I ran into this year um, that uh, had me a little bit scared, a little bit frustrated, uh, pressed for time. Uh, I had gotten an early compromise of the, uh, the, sort of the sort of corporate side of the network. I'd been able to get into the CDE. I actually had uh, a full compromise there. So I had full control over all the machines that would typically say, this is going to give me a win. This is going to get me the data I want. Um, unfortunately, uh, in, in searching through databases and looking through file shares, I wasn't able to actually find. This is a PCI pen test. So I was looking for cardholder data. I wasn't able to actually find any. Um, it, the customer had some tokenization solution in place. Uh, you know, maybe I just wasn't looking in the right place. When the time gets, uh, starts to press you, you, you think, maybe I need to get a little more creative with, with how I'm doing this, how I'm approaching it. Um, so what I wanted to do here was take a step backwards and look at, you know, what information I had collected, what did I know about the network that I could look to figure out uh, maybe a more pointed target or, or figure out where the data really would be. Um, and then one thing to point out here is that there had been some pre-engagement discussion uh, that the customer had indicated somebody is interacting with the data that I want. So I, I, I had a strong feeling or I was pretty certain that it was somewhere, I just didn't know where and how I was going to get to it. Um, so in this situation, like I said, I already had uh, control over the domain. I had um, interpreter shells open on, on a, a couple hundred hosts just because I, I was starting to uh, really sort of uh, 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 open shells and look for, look for information. Um, but one of the things I wanted to do was start to break down these uh, th those blocks a little bit more, get a feel for, for who was where. Um, so what I did was I used uh, Meterpreter to, to see who's logged on to each individual host. Uh, then I'd used Enum for Linux, which if you don't know is essentially just a wrap around RPC client to gather all of the group memberships um, and so, so see what what uh, what users were members of what groups. And, and the reason I use Enum for Linux is that it's easy to grab through. I uh, like, the, like the output and it's pretty. Um, and in this particular situation, the Active Directory groups were very indicative of uh, what uh, uh, what department the user was a member of, and so it gave me a good feel of uh, who was doing what. Uh, and the last piece of information that I was uh, I was collecting was process lists. So sort of see, um, uh, you know, was there anything unique about groups of users or programs that they were running? So essentially, what I'm trying to do was correlate uh, users, their groups, and the processes that they were running. So um, sort of an, a, a, an extrapolation of what uh, Josh was describing earlier. And what I'm trying to do is break this down from uh, something that looks like this, my understanding of the network, to something that's a little bit more detailed. Um, and, and in doing this, uh, I'll say that there was definitely some measure of, um, of desperation. You know, I, there were some hits and misses here trying to put together, was there something interesting? So I would target a group and find that there wasn't anything that I wanted. Uh, but one of the things I did notice was Almost everybody in the organization is using Google Chrome, except for people in customer service. Uh, they all have Internet Explorer open. Um, now, typically, Internet Explorer is not that interesting, but, but I simply because that they were uh, unique in their use of Internet Explorer, I decided to grab a few screenshots of the running desktops, and I see that um, they're.
using uh, Internet Explorer to open up an application that actually had some of the data I was looking for. Um, now, I didn't just want, you know, one, one piece of data I felt like isn't necessarily a great in indicator of compromise, so I wanted to uh, expand, this, expand this out a little bit further. On the recommendation of a, uh, of a coworker, I used uh, the CC search tool, which will look for um, uh, cre credit card data, PAN data. I looked through their, the uh, cache files in Internet Explorer and found that Internet Explorer was indeed holding on to, uh, to bits of this data for, for quite a bit of time. So I was able to scrape um, enough data that I felt like that this was a much better indicator of a compromise than what I had initially come through, which was just access to the network, because what I want to be able to represent is uh, we are we are finding data that is of value to the customer, and that's the real crown jewels of the, of the pen test. So, uh, in conclusion, um, I think that one of the things that that Josh and I really tossed around when we first started talking about the doing this talk was what are the things that we are doing um, tactically. Or what are the, the, the philosophical mindsets that we're using when we're running into problems? Uh, you know, like I said, if we just did a linear pen test, you got an exploit, you get the DA, and that's the end of the day, maybe it would just be one, two, three steps. But uh, I think one of the things we, we actually experience is that we run into challenges and things that, that take a little bit of creativity. Um, and what are the things that we are doing creatively, or what are the mindsets we're using to, uh, to, get, to get past some of these problems? And we've mirrored those to each one of these sections. And so uh, what I want to kind of just touch on real quickly in conclusion is what are the, the sort of philosophical bits that we, we kind of started with when we defined what these sections were supposed to mean. You know, initially talking about hiding in plain sight, and that is when you're doing a pen test, sometimes the data that you need is already there. Um, sometimes you already have it on your system. You just need to take a, take a step back and look at it to figure out, you know, how can I use it. Um, you know, low privilege is still, still privilege. I, I feel like the philosophical driver there was... Uh, don't be so set on a, a method of exploitation that, oh, I start with a user and he doesn't have admin privileges, you ditch it and move on. Look laterally, how can you, how can you utilize the access you already have to continue to, to progress the pen test? Um, we know there are holes somewhere. I think this is almost a sort of a, a foundational way we think about a pen test. When you walk into a network when you first plug in, you already know that there's going to be problems. I, I don't know that there is a network that, that the person who, who's administering it will tell you that it is perfect and it has no security flaws. Everybody will admit that there's some sort of flaw. Uh, the pen tester feel like our, our job is to, to find those things and you have to keep that in mind. That should be your, your mindset when you sit down and start. Uh, some of these are not like the others. Um, I, I feel like the, the, the takeaway or the thing that we're really driving at is being able to, to turn information into, into discrete units. So understand that you know, a group of users is unique or a group of systems is unique. Being able to use the data that you collect during a pen test to, to, to process that will make you much more effective in, uh, in, in progressing. Uh, there will never be a CV, CV for this. That was Josh's last section, I think this one was actually my favorite just because I feel like when we talk about a pen test, when we talk about vulnerabilities, a lot of the time the things that we're describing, they're not, you know, exploits the way that people mean exploits when they, when they say the word. They are architectural problems with the way that a network was designed. They're, they're sort of an inherent flaws in, in the way that we divided access or tried to prevent access between places. Uh, and, and that when you describe a vulnerability, people say, well, that's what it was supposed to do. Well, we leveraged that supposed to do into a way to get your data. Uh, and jewels in unexpected places, um, my, my sort of uh, thought process there was just that yeah, you can get access to something, but unless you're walking away with the data that the customer thinks was part of, you know, is valuable, the thing that actually has value, have you really done the pen test? Have you really um, exercised, you know, what you were supposed to do? And if not, then take a step back and, and take a broader look at, at what you're trying to do to make sure that you're, you know, delivering the most value to the customer you can. Everything else? Yeah, I was going to say, how many people in here are defenders and not offenders? Yeah, a, a couple at least. Um, if you're on the defensive side, I, I'm trying to think you know, uh, from this material what, 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 what should be useful to the defender. And I, I think the, the biggest thing is there are so many either uh, unrecognized assumptions or foregone conclusions about the way we build our environments. We don't realize what information is telegraphed, and sometimes we don't understand what information can be obtained. 
And, and really, if you look at a lot of the rigs that we have for collecting this information, it's spit and bailing wire in a sense. You know, we're, we're wrapping a tool up, we're uh, collecting information from a bunch of uh, systems, we're grepping and whatever. You guys actually have a lot of tools as the defender to know these things before we ever show up for the pen test. So it, I think a really good exercise on the defense is you know, to turn introspective and think about, you know, you know exactly where the crown jewels are, probably, uh, and can you kind of predict what indicators or what pathways are going to be evident to an attacker and, and kind of nip those in the bud in advance before they would ever manifest as a problem? But I think with that, I, I open up for Q&A. Uh, you know, feel free. And I don't know, I think we're the last one for the day. So we can probably do Q&A now or if you want to grab me outside, whatever. We'll call it. Thanks. Yeah, thanks.